I think this is a really important topic. You know, companies are spending billions of dollars around the world yep. on marketing. Here, we can sit and have a conversation here. So, who owns the well, digital let's space? Let's talk about the obvious stuff. Everybody knows Pokemon Go, right? Is Pokemon Go a crime? That's the question you really have to ask yourself. So, if you come into my backyard, and sometimes it exists in private property, and um, and you slip and fall, that's, that's a liability for me. I could be sued. Uh, and there are games that increasingly will take money from people. You know, you're not good at the game, so it recognizes that, and it says, oh, let's level you up. Well, you've just set up a digital store within my real estate. And so the argument would certainly be from the game or people who enjoy the game is, well, it's not really there. You know, it's, you know, you, it, it's not really there. I would argue uh, that it is there. It's just taking up a different space, the digital space. And as if everybody here is right, and the internet becomes three-dimensional, which is what we all hope for, there's going to have to be new rules and regulations that uh, uh, um, protect in, in the business I'm thinking about, which is real estate. I'm heavily focused on that world. And then the messaging that comes off the, off the property also needs to be something that the property owner has a participant in. It's interesting because we have had conversations with mall-owning companies. You know, companies own giant malls and. They think of this as, you know, oh, we maybe need an app for navigation or whatever. They're not thinking that we need to, we need to literally own the digital rights to our space before somebody else comes and encroaches on it. So what happens, let's say, for example, a mall. What happens if, if I make an app that works in every mall in America, and you know, now I can give you directions to the Nike store in every mall, and, and I've taken that ability away from the mall? W what happens in that case? Well, so this is a, this is a question. Am I on now? If, if this is a question that's been asked since the, the, the space began, really. This is my ninth consecutive AWE. And that's awesome. the, the, the very first one that I attended, um, the, this was a big question. Uh, John Havens at, uh, had written a piece for Mashable in June of 2011 called Who Owns the uh, Air Rights for Augmented Advertising? Uh, and when, when I, I spoke uh, in the 2012 uh, AWE, you know, I, I address this question, and we we keep coming back to it because we realize that this is that if you follow the money, this is where the money is. Your mall example is a great one because advertising is 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 where people invest their money in, and this is such a powerful medium for advertising. We've heard that at panel after panel, um, but how do you how do you make sure it's your message that gets conveyed and, and in that the messaging getting conveyed in your physical space that you own, that you retail out of, is the messaging that you want and it's not getting mixed up with other people's augmented layers. Um, the difficulty is, and, and this is where, this is why I invited Neil to, to join me on this panel originally, is because he and I um, have a lot of the same ideas. We have, a, we have some different ideas that we start from too. And, we, and we're, we're working to synthesize those ideas and, and, and share where uh, we disagree. And we want to hear, um, we want you all to hear both sides of the opinion as well. Um, my background, as, a, as an attorney, my background is in advocating for media companies. And so I'm a bit of a First Amendment purist on these questions. Um, but the, the, the law right now is, is I think, in, in, the, in the way that I view it, which is that um, it, Neil, Neil mentioned, kind of uh, borrowed my mantra that, that I keep coming back to, which is it's not really there, right? Uh, real property rights uh, govern what happens in your physical space, physical intrusions into your space. If I own a mall, I can, I can set the terms by which someone physically enters that space. Uh, augmented advertising sure looks like it's there, and that, that may or may not eventually have some sort of legal ramification, um, but it is not really there. It is cleverly depicted on your two-dimensional screen, on your two-dimensional device, to appear to you as if it's really in front of you, but it isn't. And, and the legal consequence of that is that it's not invading your physical, uh, your physical property rights, your real property rights. And look, I've even got a slide to, to illustrate that now. Thanks. So I'll buzz through these real quick. Um, so this, this captures what I had been talking about before, that we've been talking about this question for a long time. Uh, I've written a book on it. I blog on it. Uh, we keep coming back to these questions. Um, here's John Haven's article back in 2011 in, in, in Mashable. If you want to look that up, he's asking the same questions eight years ago that we're talking about right now. 
Uh, Alan, you mentioned the Burger King ad. So um, when, when I was speaking on this question going back several years, I used the exact example. What was, where this really is going to blow up is when people who actually pay real money for these things start to get their intentions interrupted. So when I, I augment the, the golden arches and a, a Burger King ad pops up, well, sure enough, that's what, exactly what we have now. Um, when the Snapchat landmark app is, is getting people uh, uh, rustled up a bit and is what Neil's particularly concerned about. So in, in this case, um, that feels like an advertisement for HBO to me. It says HBO on it, it says Game of Thrones on it. It's, it's playing on the storyline of Game of Thrones. If anyone hasn't seen Game of Thrones, there's a dragon, winter is coming, all that business. Um, I can assure you that Snapchat didn't do this for free. They were definitely paid by HBO. So this is, this is an activation, it's an engagement. And I saw it on the internet like many people did because it was shared. So they got their money's worth, which is great for HBO. The problem with it is the association with the property. And I can assure you that property owners are starting to wake up to this and they say, well, wait a minute, the messaging may may not what we like. So in the HBO, it's fun, it's nice. I mean, there was an exchanging of currency, which isn't great. And there's content that they weren't consulted on. But let's think about what this will become. So if that building was a hospital, and let's say you walked up to the hospital, and of course, we're all carrying around so much data with us, it knows maybe why we're at the hospital, because it can read through our Google account, or we searched cancer or whatever on the internet, and so we're being fed things. And that hospital has a 100-foot guy in a lab coat with a stethoscope, and he's pitching you a drug that is exactly what you need, but that drug may kill you. You may think the hospital has an association with this doctor character. That is giving false messaging from the hospital. And real estate at its core is based off of trust. There's nobody in the world that buys a piece of property and says, I want to be in the worst neighborhood. I don't ever want it to change. I want to have a high crime rate. I don't want to have social services and I don't want any food around me. That doesn't happen. People buy it because they trust that it will go up in value. They trust that it's safe. And suddenly in five years or 10 years or 1,000 years, whenever you're comfortable, that building starts to talk to me and ask for my credit card and I'm 70 years old or I'm seven years old, it may be confusing and this could drive the value of the property down. So whether it's there or not, or we determine that digital rights are actually equivalent to physical rights and then they're there, it's a big question and everybody should be thinking about how are we creating AR that doesn't infringe on other people's lives in some way. Uh I, I agree with the substance of that point, and then we're, I'm actually building to the point where where uh, where Neil and I start to converge and the legal uh, options for dealing with that sort of thing. Keep in mind what what, what he said. Uh, what I what the most important point um, an example that I take away from from that illustration is this idea of messaging being associated with the building. In this case, a hospital um, that is uh, that has a real likelihood, a real risk of of trading off the, uh, the name brand recognition, the credibility of the organization, the hospital, the, the, the actual company that operates in that building um, by virtue of having put on, put on top of that building. That I think is a, a problem potentially, and something that, that the law does give us tools to deal with. What I want to dispel first of all is, is this idea that property rights, um, at least right now, are the primary vehicle to get to that point. Now, we both agree this is an ad. That's an ad that appears to be on top of that building. Uh, Landmarkers has been doing this for a while with, with other famous buildings. These are obviously uh, more public memorial type of things in these particular examples, but it happens like with the Flatiron building on privately owned la and land as well. We have uh, Microsoft getting into the location-based AR game this year uh, with Minecraft. This is more and more augmented space is going to be, augmented content is going to be put on top of privately owned space. Um, what I first wanted to talk about is the, the, this First Amendment hurdle to get there. Why This is why property rights aren't the vehicle, uh, the best vehicle for dealing with this. Now, I, I've been approached by I don't know how many people with, with the legitimately good idea of, hey, let's set up a registry for this idea so that uh, we have, we're, we're create, let's create a business model where owners of physical space can buy into the digital versions of their, their, their uh, physical space in order to, to uh, prevent augmentation from going on there without uh, their content. Basically a DNS for the physical world. Um, issue with that is, I, I've already explained the disconnect with, with uh, physical property rights. The air rights is a, is a, is a common uh, term that we, we apply to this. 
technically not accurate. Error rights are a zoning issue uh, that um, you, where you get to trade how tall your building is. The zoning law puts a, a, a particular height restriction, but if your building is, is below that restriction, you can sell off the gap to somebody else so they can be that much higher. Uh, it, it's really talking about physical error uh, rather than uh, the, the digital space and, and augmented content visible there. Um, there. There are really two different realms of, of legal, uh, legal jurisprudence here. We have property rights or the right to exclude physical intrusions into my space, prevent you from coming into my space, whereas speech rights are the, 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 the right to express yourself and content. Very, very narrow point of interaction between those two. Right? We have cases dealing with, well, can I hold a protest in a public mall? Because even though it's private property, it's really open to the public, and so I ought to have some sort of expression rights there. Uh, I've, I've painted graffiti on the side of your building, but now I have copyright interest in that graffiti, so can you as the property owner uh, remove it without my permission? You know, those are the very, very thin uh, areas of intersection between these two areas of law. The question is where location-based AR will end up in that intersection. Uh, we've talked about already, we kind of snuck uh, to, the, to the conclusion here, it's not really there. I've argued that that, that matters, I think that it does matter. Um, example here, the same building, so the Flatiron building we see in the Snapchat example. Um, it's already depicted in so many ways, right? Going back to these uh, old postcards in Minecraft, somebody built a representation of it. Uh, you can go on Google Maps and augment it by putting your own tag on top of it on that two-dimensional screen. You can paint a picture of it. It shows up in film, Spider-Man swings in front of the building. Why can't I put an augmented layer? How is this meaningfully conceptually different from these other uses of the exterior of this building? By the way, this building is old enough that it's not protected by some of the newer copyright laws uh, that, that might actually give the creator of the architectural work some additional uh, rights. But even then, even new and, newer architectural works are, uh, are subject to an exemption that lets you depict a building on the side of the road. Can, can I just ask one question? Yeah. Can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to... to but, so newer building, let's say for example, I, I design a building, I build it, somebody comes along and takes a photogrammetry of the building and then starts using it in a video game. What are the, ro what are the rules with that? So we're talking about you know, digital rights. What about a, you know, a design that is clearly you know, protected by copyright, but I've now photo taken photogrammetry, I've created a 3D you know, digital twin of it and then put it into other use cases. Sure. Who owns that model? Like well, that's a great question because you, you have an exception that lets you take a picture of it, depict it as it appears on the street level, right? Um, but it, when you are fully reproducing the work in a digital sense and then uh, cre recreating that work in, in these digital spaces, there, there's, there's room to argue that, that now you're exercising rights that only the copyright owner owns. If you owns. make a movie and there's a Ferrari driving in the background, no problem. I come from a film space. You make a video game and you're driving a Ferrari that implies that Ferrari has endorsed the experience. And I would argue in the building, in the, the three-dimensional augmented world, if you're looking at it and there's a commerce, again, I'm 100% for free speech, for art, no problem. But if there's a confusion of the public, and Brian can talk to the law associated with this, that says you can't confuse the public into thinking something endorses some, a product. And then if you're exchanging information and data and monetizing that, I think that takes it to a different level. But you, I think you could explain the Lanham Act and how that works. Yeah, so um, just briefly on the, this last case here, this last slide on, on this section, if we could take that back, thanks. Um, we have one, one bit of, of precedent to work with here. A couple years ago, right after Pokemon Go came out, uh, municipalities reacted to all these crowds of players walking around doing things that were unexpected. Uh, dealing with abnormal behavior. Milwaukee went the furthest to say, uh, not only are we gonna regulate you know, physical activity if you trample the daisies, uh, we, we have laws to deal with that. If you're out past curfew or in the park past its closing date, we have rules already to deal with that. Bob, well, we're gonna be clever. We're gonna pass this ordinance that says you're not even allowed to publish a location-based AR game that takes place in our parks without our permission. Um, short story, 
We, um, I, I found a client willing to challenge that, uh, Candy Lab AR, they've, they've demonstrated here in the past. Uh, we sued the county of Milwaukee. We got that struck down as a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, got a permanent injunction against the law. We got our attorney's fees paid by the county. Uh, and the, the judge wrote a brilliant opinion to say, uh, you can't do that. So uh, that is one data point, but at least it's a stake in the ground that says, now we've got some legal precedent to work with that um, your, your rights to control the park don't necessarily allow you to control augmented gaming that happens in that space. On behalf of the entire industry, I would like to get a round of applause for that because this is the first case precedent. It's a big deal. You know, that, that you literally made a precedent for an entire industry that's been talking about this for 11 years. So uh, I'm, I'm just grateful for that. Having had that opportunity, it was, it was a uh, perfect storm moment, right, where we had something that was so, I thought, low-hanging fruit from a legal perspective to really chop that down. So uh, I, I, was, I was just grateful for the opportunity to do that. But I really do want to make sure we have time to, to talk about Neil's point, which is the Lanham Act. So if property rights don't give us the, uh, an option to do something about content, uh, what are other options are there? And again, remember, I'm a, I'm a speech purist here. I'm not going and advocating that everybody run and, and, and sue game makers and, and get this content taken off. But I'm, I'm acknowledging that there, in certain factual circumstances, there's, there are options. Um, the law of trespass is not the best. Um, but it's, it's worth just noting for your informational purposes here that there, there was this class action uh, against Niantic over Pokemon Go that it was a, a series of consolidated cases decided right here in San Francisco federal court and settled only uh, a couple months ago. Uh, and they, the argument there was that was not so much that the digital content itself was a trespass. They, they, they kind of, they teased that argument, but they eventually gave it up uh, when, when the court balked at that. But the argument was, well, they induced trespass. You're, in, you're inducing players to come step on my property, um, and, and, and thus you're liable for it. Never made it to a, to a resolution, the case settled, but that argument has been made. Uh, but there are other similar precedents. If you, are, if you run a scavenger hunt, for example, there have been cases that say, well, you have a heightened duty to make sure that the environment in which that scavenger hunt takes place in um, is safe because you, users, players, they're not paying as much attention to their surroundings because they're scrambling to get this, uh, this content that they're looking for. Now, that's, that's, that's an analogy you can draw to certain games, um, not necessarily persistent games like this one, but other situations you can use when you're using AR uh, to, uh, to make a location-based game, that can be an issue. But the Lanham Act here, is the, the federal statute that governs trademark law. Trademark infringement, trade dress infringement. It's, it's a broadly written statute uh, that is designed to prevent customer confusion. That goes back to Neil's example about the hospital and, and the virtual doctor speaking on top of the hospital. Um, that suggests a claim for false endorsement, uh, unfair competition, false advertising, all of which are options under this Lanham Act. And uh, the core of each of these causes of action is a likelihood of confusion. Uh, did your content that you've used in commerce create a likelihood that consumers are going to be confused about who it comes from? Um, so that's, a reason, that's the reason why trademark infringement is a problem, because you use a, a word or a logo that is too similar to an existing brand. Customers are going to look at that, and they're going to be confused. Does this come from the brand I know, or is this some other company? Or just mindlessly think that it is that other brand. That's a problem because that, that, that in, interferes with the commercial interests of that existing brand. Um, same thing here, and that's where the location of your augmented content, your augmented advertising can matter. Right? If, if the choice of location causes a, li a likelihood that consumers are going to be confused, um, that can give rise to an issue here. Now this, this example is, is a long, this has been around 10 years. Um, this particular BP protest app uh, we came out back in the uh, Gulf oil spill uh, incident, and this was uh, an app that you augment any BP sign and show a leaky oil pipe on top of it. This is, that's First Amendment speech. Nobody's going to touch that. That's that's protest speech and the political speech. Um, but it it proves the point that uh, associating content with with uh, existing logos can give a message that the logo owner certainly didn't intend. Oh, no, nobody sued over that. That's just a, a, a graphic example of what can happen. Um, 
Neil, I want to make sure that uh, oh, the other, this is just a point to show um, other uh, municipalities, other states have tried, at least started to legislate against AR content. None of these, other than Milwaukee, none of these jurisdictions actually got their law uh, passed and signed. They, they died in committee. Um, and thankfully, because they were all overreaches. New York, for example, wanted to ban uh, AR content, geolocated AR content within 500 feet of the residence of a sex offender. Well, that pretty much means you get no AR content in the city of New York. <laughs> That's the quote of the day. <laughs> But I want, I want Neil to get a chance. Neil, Neil, like I mentioned, is one of these folks that has, has had an entrepreneurial idea of, of I want to help business owners in this space. And uh, I want to get him, him to have a chance to talk about that. Yeah, I don't think this is about being litigious. That, certainly that is the thing you want to avoid. Um, but the property owners, who is, which is the largest asset class in the world, $217 trillion, they are not going to stand for invasions of their property. They're, they're, they want protections from liability. I mean, if you think about, you know, we've all gone to the mall and we've, we've seen the kids in the school choir and maybe you've seen a puppet show. If you were to be a part of that and see that puppet show, the puppet show would have needed to supply a certificate of insurance, period. Uh, Pokemon or other games, I only use Pokemon example because it's the most famous, uh, but these games are using environments and causing people to have traffic there and play, maybe not pay attention, where they become a liability, and then yet there's no insurance certificate that's provided. How is that experience different is the position that they look at. They also think about the augmentation of the brands that exist within the malls. So you have a Starbucks, you have a Diesel, uh, even somebody on in the inside or outside. They have negotiated heavily for signage rights and what that can look like, what the light on it can be, or what time of night it can be on, how it can engage. And now all of a sudden, again, as we move to this three-dimensional internet, what's common and what, it, it, what we're going to see is stuff sort of jumping off of everything. And does that Starbucks have the right to augment into the common space, like the famous scene in Back to the Future 2 where the shark jumps out at him? Is that OK? Uh, the building owners are wrestling with this. So now they're thinking, do we need to do new lease agreements? You know, how do we address this? This is a really good point, and, and I think you, know, you, you said being litigious isn't the solution. And no. I, I think what the messaging uh, that you're going to get to, and, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think the property owners need to take a proactive stance and start partnering with people in this room yeah, definitely. and say, let's just take an ownership and we'll just be the ones who provide the digital content and that way we can control it from the very beginning. Yeah, that is the point, is to make these relationships, have an agreement, everybody uh, trying to do the right thing and treat people properly, because it's gonna move from property owners to Alan's face. He's gonna have a Lacoste logo just you know, put onto him through some app. And you know, I don't see the Facebooks of the world necessarily getting too aggressive with this, because they're already, they have so many eyeballs on them, uh, but smaller apps will do thing, and you, know, you have to sort of ask, well, if it's so small, it's like if a tree falls in the woods and never hear, no one hears it, did it make a sound? Big apps are going to have big impacts. You know, Facebook is the internet for many people. And so when you activate Facebook three-dimensionally, you're going to see all kinds of content. And they will want to have rights to those properties, as will people here. Do you think there would be uh, something in the future, maybe? We, let, let's fast forward five years and we're wearing glasses and you know, we have digital content all around us. Do you think if I walk in and I, I happen to be a Facebook user, my Facebook, I have my Facebook app open and I walk through the mall and I get the Facebook experience of what the mall would look like. Or if I'm a Snapchat user, I get the Snapchat experience. Or it could be you know, custom for me, obviously. I'm, I'm 14 versus 40. It's going to be different content. But the platforms that are feeding the, the glasses or the, the, heads, the, the phones, they're the, going to be the ones that are creating this content or making this available. How does a, a property owner then preemptively protect against that? It well, seems th there should be an arrangement uh, Facebook, like you know, now they don't make content; they distribute other people's content, and so and they're already selling the advertising of the internet at mass. And so they will take a contract to every single piece of real estate, and the real estate owners will happily do business with them. As you pointed out, it'll all be different experiences; it'll be tailored. And in exchange for having that partnership, there should be a small piece of revenue that gets uh, trickled down into the property. And just like if you were Amazon and you had a portal, and people clicked and it went through and it purchased, or Google, who's always doing that, you become the portal. That is the position that they're going to take as the internet starts to play and have an association with the physical world. And I, I see their position and would love to work with all partners to make sure they come together in a meaningful way that 
protects everybody and everybody makes money. That's the goal. Sure. And, and if uh, Neil's group goes a little too far in, in pushing their rights against your augmented content, I'd love to represent you. <laughs>